Hello, everyone. Um, we want to welcome everyone to uh, the what is actually the third uh, celebration of Latinx studies at 50 years. Uh, this is uh, there was a speaker panelist speaker uh, uh, event in the fall, uh, and then one with. Um, uh, our founding authors in the field. And now this is the conclusion looking at the intersectionality within Latinx studies with a focus on queer, feminist, uh, Central American, indigenous and Afro Latinidades. So I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, the, the event is sponsored by the Center for Gender and Sexuality Studies of which I, Josefina Saldana Portillo, am the interim chair for this year, and by the Latinx Project, directed by Professor Arlene Davila. Anyway, without any further ado, I'm going to read, well, I want to remind everyone, if you would be so kind as to make sure you put your questions for the panelists in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen, rather than the chat. We're gonna be looking at the Q&A for questions for, from the audience. Um, I would also like to um, let you all know that the format is going to be conversational. We wanna foster a conversation between the four panelists uh, on certain uh, questions that we've brought into focus. Uh, and we would like to, um, let's get started so we can have as much time as possible for that. Uh, working on the principle of age and beauty before youth and beauty, uh, I will begin by introducing Professor Vicky Rees, a distinguished professor emerita of history and Chicano Latinx studies at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, Vicky is a first generation college bound students, college bound student and she received her PhD in history from Stanford University in 1982. She's an award winning scholar and educator and both her Cannery Women, Cannery Lives and From Out of the Shadows, Mexican Women in the 20th Century America are foundational texts in Chicanx feminist and Latinx feminist history. Vicky herself is a founding scholar of gender and sexuality studies within Chicanx and Latinx studies, and she has been an exemplary founding scholar in these fields in, and in history in terms of her mentorship, having advised 27 dissertations and, and thereby mentoring four generations of graduate students from across the country. As I said, Vicky has award, uh, received numerous awards and prizes for her scholarship and her educational um, and, as, and as an educator. And the perhaps the most recent or certainly the most amazing of her many amazing awards is having received the National Humanities Medal uh, from President Barack Obama in 2015. Yes. A round of applause. Uh, Professor Arturo Arias is the um, D John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Professor in the Humanities at the University of California, Merced. Arturo has been key in establishing the field of Central American studies within Latinx studies. Indeed, he is a founder of that field, having published several volumes on Guatemalan and Central American letters, including most recently, Recovering Lost Footprints, Contemporary Mayan Narratives, two volumes in 2018 and 2017, and also Taking Their Word, Literature and the Science of Central America in 2007. Professor Arias is also a creative writer and has written seven novels and co-wrote the screenplay for El Norte, the film. Uh, in recognition of his outstanding scholarship, Arturo has twice won the Casa de las Americas Award, as well as the Anne Sagers Award for Fiction in Germany. Perhaps dearest of all his recognitions, however, Arturo received the Miguel Angel Asturias National Award for Lifetime Achievement in Literature in 2008 in his native Guatemala. Tania Cateri Hernandez is the Archibald Murray Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law, where she is an Associate Director of the Center on Race, Law, and Justice. Hernandez is a Fulbright Scholar who holds a BA from Brown University and her law degree from Yale University. She is an expert on many things, including bi and multiracial experience and identity in the US. 
uh, and Professor Hernandez has indeed spearheaded the movement for the recognition and inclusion of Africa, Afro-Latinx history and experience within Latinx studies, as is evident by her most recent publications, Multiracials and Civil Rights, Mixed Race Stories of Discrimination, and her forthcoming book with Beacon Press, Racial Innocence, Unmasking Latino Anti-Black Bias and the Struggle for Equality. She is also the author of Racial Subordination in Latin America, America, the role of the state, customary law, and new civil rights responses. Larry, Larry Lafontaine Stokes is professor and chair of the Department of American Culture at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where he has also served as the director of the Latino Latin, Latino A. Uh, Latina O Studies Program. Uh, Larry is also a professor of Romance Languages and Literatures and of Women and Gender and Sexuality at UMich. Larry is far too young and pretty to be a founding member of Latinx Queer Studies. Nevertheless, <laughs> his scholarship has deepened and broadened this field. His Queer Ricans, Cultures and Sexualities in the Diaspora is a key text for Latinx Queer Studies and all queer studies, as will be his most recent book, Trans Locas, The Politics of Puerto Rican Drag and Trans Performance, out in 2021 with Umish Press, which has already received, and this is a very big recognition, Larry, congratulations, the 2021-2022 Silvia Rivera Award in Transgender Studies from CLACS. Uh, the City University of New York's uh, Center, Center for Gender and Sexuality Studies. He has co-edited Queer Issues of Centro Journal Sargosa, Sargo, Sargasso and Hostess Review Revista Ostiana. And like Arturo, Larry is also a fiction writer and has two books out. Uh, Titles here, but they are in the chat. Larry performs as drag, and he performs in drag as Lola von Miramar since 2010. And he's appeared in several episodes of, U of the YouTube series Cooking with Drag Queens. These are fantastic. So, with that introduction, I remind you the, the full biologies, the full biographies are in the chat, and I turn it over to Simon now uh, so he can uh, proceed to the panel questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Josie, for that introduction. Um, there was, I was catching some static feedback on when I was listening. Is that, um, yeah, I hope the audio issues don't persist, but please let me know if they do and I'm not aware of them. But um, it's really my uh, pleasure and honor to welcome you all tonight to uh, this conversation. Uh, Latinx studies at the Vanguard uh, at 50 at the Vanguard of Ethnic Studies Part 2, which as Josie mentioned, is the last installment of a year-long slate of programming that revisits questions, urgencies, and figures foundational to Latinx studies in order to really refresh our current understanding of the field and its future possibilities. And so in framing tonight's conversation, which is co-sponsored by the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality, I actually want to linger a little bit on the event's subtitle, right? What it means to invoke the vanguard, uh, to think about the relationship between Latinx studies and the critical and commensurate and incomplete project of ethnic studies writ large. And so, you know, the, when we typically associate the vanguard with a type of cutting edge, right? A kind of advanced position, the front line, right? Um, one of the things I think the Vanguard kind of calls in the question is kind of, you know, or that there's, we already know what we, uh, ahead of time of what uh, liberation looks like or what um, decolonization would look like or what justice would look like. And I think what we find ourselves in the position right now is a kind of um, a, a, a reckoning with the fact that we actually don't know better than we did in the past. <laughs> and that there's a certain uh, linear presupposition about the flow of history, about the flow of time, about the flow of power um, that underwrites some, the, uh, an idea that because we're, we're, we're looking back that we know better. Um, and so tonight, I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to talking about is really kind of what does it mean to, to um, approach both the past and the historical moment with, uh, or, and, 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 and moments in history with, with moments of surprise, right? With moments of not presuming that we know any better, but really kind of confronting the fact that some of the structural issues that 
enabled something like ethnic studies to emerge, right? Intensified racialized and gendered segmentation in labor, border crises, resurgent imperialism, the breakdown of, of, of a kind of um, a network by which we can rethink uh, our histories in, in, in a kind of critical public way. Um, these, these issues are still with us, right? These issues have not resolved. And so um, this leads us kind of, you know, and I think, you know, thinking about in particular how the, the study of gender and sexuality is, has been really a, a decisive uh, factor and intervention in our kind of presupposition of, of linear time and linear power. And so I guess one of the things I guess I want to start off asking our, our panelists and kind of kick off our dialogue today is kind of really um, at which point um, do our panelists or do, can we begin to even uh, come to terms with uh, when gender and sexuality become vital categories of analysis uh, for your scholarship in Latinx studies? Um, so like, for example, what would, what, like with Stonewall, what could Stonewall mean? Uh, for example, in for Latinx studies in, in 1969. And that's just one moment out of many other moments, many other in, insurgencies and insurrections that we could point to. And I suppose I'm curious, like, and we're, we're curious in how these critiques and social movements um, that have kind of uh, addressed the kind of interplay of gender and sexuality, how they transformed uh, the way that we kind of engender our fields or querying our fields of study or, or understand the, the, the need to continue our fields of study. So I'll just pause there and, and uh, just humbly ask that our, you know we begin dialogue. So. Okay, I guess I'll start off with sort of a, a personal <laughs> reminiscence. Uh, I was a transfer student from Gulf Coast Community College, fully intending to become a high school history teacher. I took a course on US women's history in winter quarter of 1976 that changed my life. Uh, the professor, Jingle Bryant, asked me to come see her during office hours. I was really, I was petrified. I, I had not done this before. I thought I'd done something wrong. And so I go to her office and so she asked me about my, my major and I said, I'm an education major. She says, well, you enjoy your classes. And I said, no, I hate them because I really did. And she said, well, you know, talked to me about my interest in history and said, well, have you thought about going to graduate school? I said, no, graduate school is for people who are smart and people who are rich and I'm not of those. And he goes, oh, you don't have to be rich. And you know, you have a lot of potential. And so she began mentoring me, you know, you know, telling me, you know, pushing me, doing line edits, you know, showing me uh, sort of what was then, you know, this was way before the internet and email. So it was college catalogs. You know, sharing you know people's works at, at different institutions, and then in spring quarter we did not have African American studies. What we had was a course called race relations, and it was offered by a young African American sociologist from UCLA. It was her first job. She grew up in Pasadena. I can't imagine Leonore's transition to Florida State, but I took the course and I saw her, you know, packed lecture hall. And she was just magnificent. And I thought, wow, I really would like to do something like this. So being more brave, I went to see her during her office hours. And she asked me about my background and I told her and she began to loan me books in Chicano studies. But as almost you know, as a, you know, instinctive feminist and probably second waiver at that, you know, I was noticing there are not a lot of, you know, Chicano studies in Chicano, you know, emphasis on the masculine all. Oh. And I was like, Okay, um, I want to do Chicana history. So I knew by my senior year, I didn't know why I was going to go to graduate school, but I knew it was going to be I, the research I wanted to do was in Chicana history because it's the first time. I mean, Rudy Acuna's Occupied America was the first time that I saw my family stories in print. Uh, so that's sort of how I came into gender. And in terms of sexuality, I will have to say that. Uh, 1981, this bridge called my back, you know, really, you know, really sort of uh, expanded my awareness. Uh, and it reinforced a lot of things that, that, that I had been through, but had not, you know, couldn't have a name for it. Uh, and then my beloved co-mentor Estelle Friedman at Stanford, her 1970 article, Separatism as Strategy, and being pushed by the Dissertation Women's History Group, you know, who... I was stuck in the dissertation 
And I was just wedded to this idea that people join this union because of its great decentralized structure and because of this charismatic women organizers, not realizing about the power of chisme. But people like the late, like uh, Joanne Meyerowitz, and then later on the late Peggy Pasco, uh, sort of pushed me to see that, you know, the idea that uh, how one day women were passing out, passing around Palms Cold Cream and the next union pledge cards, and that I really needed to focus on this network. I need to focus on these women's interior interior lives, and it's still, you know, when it comes to that, I think you know particularly. When I look at from out of the shadows, I'm still very much a, a uh, work in progress, and I really appreciate all the critiques uh, and uh, my former graduate students, especially Lara Munoz and Marianne Villarreal, um, for for uh, uh, for for pushing me. So I think that in terms of for me, it's very much how I it was through this U.S. Women's History course that. You know, I am not a high school history teacher in Florida. It's also how actually history brought you to Chicano Latino studies and transformed absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Tanya, Ar Arturo, Larry, who wants to go next? I could go if you want, that's no problem. Uh, for me, it was kind of uh, a lived, historical process because I was born in Guatemala and raised there. I lived as a baby, the US intervention in 1954, which destroyed Guatemalan democracy and begat us, you know, a 36 year old civil war. I grew up until I finished high school and left under siege, so to speak, uh, with uh, all kinds of things happening, violent acts, all sorts of things. So that my knee-jerk instinct was to struggle against, you know, dictatorship and oppression, first in Guatemala, and obviously then that got extended to Central America, Latin America, mm -hmm. began building, coincided with the Vietnam War when I came to the US to study uh, at Boston University. And um, then, that process began to branch out, especially in the 1980s, because the 1980s were possibly the worst years of the Civil War in the case of Guatemala, which also ties to my obsession with indigenous cultures as it was when the Mayas, approximately a quarter of a million Mayas were murdered or displaced from the country and began migrating to the US. So at that time, I began to come to the US. I was not living in the US, I was living in Mexico, but to do lecture tours to talk about what was happening in Guatemala and Central America. And so two really interesting things happened in that process. The first one was in 1984, I was in San Francisco talking about what was happening in Central America. And it so happened that I was at a place that older people would know. It was named Valencia Rose, and it was like a community center in, uh, in the mission area of San Francisco. And um, so I was there, and I had my audience, and I was talking. And all of a sudden, we began to hear all this tremendous noise going on. And um, what it turned out to be was that on that day, uh, the mayor had decided to close the baths of San Francisco because of AIDS. And so there was a huge mobilization of the San Francisco gay community mm -hmm. that added to, they did want to deal with AIDS obviously, but they thought that was the wrong way of going about it. And so to a large degree, that brought me into a greater consciousness with what was happening with communities in which I had never participated or been a part of up until that time. So moving along, just when I kind of, when I decided to return to the US and begin an academic career in the US in 1990, I was again in San Francisco 
because I had been offered a position uh, in San Francisco State. That was the first institution I worked at. And I was introduced to Miguel. Miguel was a Guatemalan himself who had been involved in the Guatemalan struggle, but was gay. And at the time was in San Francisco by innovates. And so we became very, very close. He told me all the stories about what had happened in Guatemala, what it meant to be gay in Guatemala in the early 80s, in the 1970s, um, all kinds of terrible issues. And then just before he passed, he made me promise that I would never forget and to keep supporting you know, the struggles of the gay community. That's, what it was at the time before it brought in into all the other issues. To me, it seemed absolutely natural because after all struggling on behalf of the Guatemalan people and of Maya peoples within Guatemala implied always supporting marginalized societies, subalternized societies, racialized societies, everybody that was not in the spotlight. And so that began to compound, so to speak, my own uh, understanding of the process. And it gradually began to come together as more uh, people that I knew of, mainly in academia as well as uh, in the literary world throughout Latin America, either began to become more proactive in GLBTQ issues but then it became a big part of LASA, the Latin American Studies Association, in which I had been participating roughly since the mid 1980s. It was, it was in 1994, uh, LASA took place in Atlanta and Jim Franco organized a series of panels on Latin American gay, lesbian, queer issues. I knew Jean, I liked her very much. Obviously I showed up at the panels and to my surprise, it was so packed that it was almost impossible to get in. Um, and then four years later in 1998, um, Susan, oh God, I forget her last name. I apologize, Susan. <laughs> Sociologist from Boston University, in fact, uh, who was last president at the time, was the one who decided to create sections within the Latin American Studies Association. I was at the time part of the executive committee. And so of course, um, I thought that was great. And um, one of the first sections precisely that was created was the, the name has changed always. It began, I think, a sexuality section, if I'm not wrong. And so that opened up um, for me a greater connection with the people who were behind the section as I was then, like I said, in the executive committee and then later I was elected as a president. So it was my turn to come and defend uh, not just uh, the section, but the emergence of the Latino section within LASA too. And it all coincided, uh, LASA that year was March of 2003, the year of my presidency, uh, was days before George W. Bush began bombing Iraq. So it became, instead of just an academic meeting, it became very much an activist meeting. I had invited Rigoberta Menchu to come and give a keynote speech. And she took the ball onto herself and we began organizing a whole series of events. That Saturday, we took the entire LASA team just about in a demonstration through downtown Dallas. And um, so the more all these things were happening, the more it became obvious that one could approach knowledge and concerns about people, social issues, et cetera, from various angles, but that all the struggles were connected and that you had to kind of look at all of them at the same time. And so, in that logic then, I have remained to this day extremely supportive of, um, of um, GLBTQ 
struggles and issues and work with them. I thought when a weird president that came about two periods after me wanted to abolish the Latino study section. And so we challenged him and forced him to retreat and to allow it to happen. And um, of course, along the way, I plunged more and more into indigenous studies, beginning with the Maya experience in Guatemala, but moving forth into all kinds of angles and you know, trust indigenous issues and this and that. So that it was for me, you know, almost impossible not to think that everything that is not mainstream, Europe, uh, Eurocentric and racist are struggles to be connected and to be worked with throughout, which has remained my position until now. Thank you, Arturo. I love the focus on the synergies of social movements and political conjunctures that have always uh, forced marginalized groups into relations of solidarity. Mm -hmm. Mary Tanya, who wants to that, also, Tanya, also happy birthday, Jean Franco. Today is her, I think, 96th birthday. Uh, and if I was in New York, I'd be celebrating with her. <laughs> but, <laughs> Please give her my best. I will, I will. Okay. Mary, Tanya, who's going to go Tanya, next? Tanya, do you want to go Tanya? next? Oh, I, I can go next. Um, I, I can be very brief. Um, oh, it's funny where the camera just changed like that. Uh, in any case, um, I feel like I'm really very fortunate in that I enter into graduate school, for me, law school, uh, right at the time where critical race theory was, you know, really uh, taking hold. Uh, and intersectionality, sort of a foundational aspect of critical race theory. Uh, and so when I, you know, later uh, enter academia uh, to focus on issues of racial discrimination, it is sort of just baked into how I examine uh, issues of discrimination to be doing it from an intersectional perspective. Uh, so for me in Latino studies, um, that has meant looking at uh, the category Latino, Latina, uh, as inherently intersectional uh, mm -hmm. with regards in particular uh, uh, to Afro-Latinidades. Um, but to speaking to the issue of uh, gender, the way in which that has come up for me is that in looking at issues of discrimination in the workplace, uh, what I discovered in sort of, you know, trying to elevate the stories of Latino, Latina victims is that discrimination doesn't take it doesn't manifest the same way, even within the same group. So that is to say, uh, you know, Latinos, Latinas are discriminated against, um, but it is distinctive when sexualization is a fundamental part of the racialization project as well, right? And, you know, and that's also, you know, in the foundational aspect of, within ethnic studies and Latino studies, right? the ways in which these isms are mutually reinforcing and interlocking and mutually so socially constructed. Okay. Um, enough with the theoretical talk. Uh, let me give you some sort of very pragmatic aspects of this before I turn it over to Larry. Um, in sexual harassment, for instance, uh, what I found um, was that the Latina victim of sexual harassment wasn't similarly situated <laughs> uh, with, uh, with respect to these matters uh, as a white woman, a white Anglo woman. And why? Uh, because the way in which she was sexually harassed was also a racial discrimination claim because part of the um, subordination of Latinas in the workplace is about sexualizing their racial identity right? um, and viewing them as inherently wanton, inherently sexy, and blah, 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 in any case. Um, and for me, that is a uh, way in which the issue of gender identity um, has been very much a key part of my own uh, work in Latino studies that has had to do uh, with matters of uh, gender discrimination. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. I, I'll turn a little later when, uh, when we talk about racial diversity. I'll, I'll talk more about the Afro-Latino aspects of the, the research. Thank you so much, Tanya. I just want to, you know, the intersectionality, the way in which sexuality and gender are always playing a role in racialization. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Mary. Oh, thank you, Tanya. 
So th there's so many ways to answer this question and, and so many ways to dialogue with the insights that Vicky and Arturo and Tania have shared. But I was trying to think um, where, where to start. Uh, and one place to start is uh, as a teenager in Puerto Rico, uh, growing up in the 1980s and coming across Manuel Puig's Kiss of the Spider Woman and, and seeing how a novel, which is a work of fiction and a literary work, is also a theoretical work. Uh, and in fact, quite explicitly, because the footnotes in that novel are a long history of psychoanalysis and the way that homosexuality was pathologized um, in psychoanalytic thought. Um, and reading people like Ana Lidia Vega and Rosario Ferre, and sort of starting to, to realize that, that, uh, that writing and literature were these very creative um, and transformational spaces. And, and of course, um, becoming an undergrad and all of a sudden being exposed um, to people like Nestor Perlonger, writing about gay cruising in Sao Paulo as an exiled Argentinian poet and going to grad school and then getting to, to read Gloria and Saldua and learning about this bridge called My Back, but also reading Luisa Capetillo. So somehow like really uh, negotiating between uh, the multiple meanings of Latinidad, thinking of myself as Latin American and Caribbean and a Caribbeanist, but, but also being exposed to the reality and the specificity of Latina, Latino studies, or the Latinx experience in the United States as something different and distinct, but also profoundly tied to what happens in, in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. So, so these are things that are exciting to me. It's exciting to me that when uh, Vicky Ruiz and Virginia Sanchez Coral um, edited Latina Legacies uh, in 2005, they included an essay on Luisa Capetillo, because Luisa Capetillo is such a complex figure. Um, she wrote in Spanish. She lived mostly in the Caribbean and sometimes in Florida and New York. She was profoundly homophobic, but she was also uh, um, a proponent of free love uh, and of challenging the church and, and of course of wearing pants uh, for women uh, for which she was incarcerated. So, so, I mean, so we can start at the beginning of the 20th century. We can even go to the 19th century if we want to think of how people like Alejandro Tapia in Puerto Rico was proposing a feminist vision. But we can also jump to the 21st century or the, the turn of the century and think about um, the transformations that Jose Munoz allowed us to do in 1999 with these identifications. But also the transformations that somebody like Martin Duberman allowed me personally uh, to do um, by learning about Silvia Rivera. So Martin Duberman is not a Latina, Latino studies scholar, but his book Stonewall featured Silvia Rivera. And for me, that was almost like a key uh, allowing me to walk up to Silvia Rivera at the LGBT pride parade in New York City and all of a sudden knowing who she was and basically then dedicating 25 years of research and scholarship to writing about a trans Puerto Rican Venezuelan pioneer like Silvia Rivera. So the intersections are, are so many. Um, and I, I studied with Jean Franco. So I, at Columbia University, I think I was only able to write a dissertation about a Puerto Rican gay and lesbian migration and culture because there was a supportive person who was not queer and was not Latina, but she was supportive and she knew how to connect me to people like Juan Flores, an expert on Puerto Rican diaspora, but also to Arnaldo Cruz Malave, uh, an expert in Puerto Rican queerness and in queer Latino testimonio. So I think that that speaks to the role of allies. It speaks to the intersections of Latin American feminist thought the fact that we were reading and meeting people like Nelly Richard writing about feminist and queer trans performance in Chile, but also seeing what was happening in the United States with people like Cherie Moraga or Gloria Ansaldúa. So those are the things that excite me. I mean, I, I sometimes probably overuse the metaphor of bridge, but I do see myself and it is a useful metaphor when we think of the kind of work we do whether it is bridging 
queer studies and Latinx and Latin American studies, whether it's bridging um, our, our own fields within our national or our ethnic fields, because many people in Latinx studies are, and in Latin American studies are very resistant to gender and sexuality. And many people who do gender and sexuality are very resistant to the critical analysis of race and ethnicity. So the challenges are multiple, but I think that's what's exciting about what we do, that we can actually make multiple different interventions and that we serve to connect the points, connect the dots between these different um, academic fields. Thank you so much, Larry. That's a lot. All of you have given us a lot to think about. I wanna really underscore the importance of literature for the for gender and sexuality studies because i think a lot of us first encountered that alternative sexual feelings alternative desires in literature and and has has you know often said especially those of us in literary studies have also has often set us on the path we're on but would you care to respond to each other before we go on to the other uh, do you have questions for each other before we go on to the next question that we've posed collectively You can go on, I think. Okay, so uh, this question was inspired by Larry, who pointed us to these touchstone texts, which have already come up, that were so important in um, conceptualizing gender and sexuality for Latinx studies. Anzaldúa and Moraga's This Bridge Call My Back, Anzaldúa's uh, Borderlands La Frontera, uh, José Muñoz's Disidentification. So we wanted you all to speak a little bit about the relevance, and you are, some of you already have, so uh, the relevance of these texts to your own scholarship or other books that you can consider foundational uh, for the analysis of gender and sexuality within Latinx studies. Um, some that perhaps aren't quite as institutionalized as This Bridge Call My Back or Loving in the War years or, uh, you know, uh, La Frontera, Borderlands La Frontera. Um, I don't know who wants to start us off. And maybe we can think a little bit about trying to keep our answers within five minutes, just uh, so we can get to all our questions. They're such good questions. Who wants to start us off? Well, Vicky, go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say the, uh, you know, for me, the education was just not the text but that 1989 uh, Knox conference and seeing the personal courage of Dina Gonzalez and Emma Perez and Antonia Castaneda. I mean, to see and to see that, you know, standing up the way in which, you know, their courage, the, the vilification uh, really changed I lost respect for a lot of colleagues. And I was so glad that, that, that Emma published The Decolonial Imaginary because I think that is a really foundational text. And it really sort of comes, you know, sort of the after, and you could see the aftermath of that 1989 Knox meeting. I also think that foundational is Patricia Saveas, I'm neither here nor there because it really is an on the ground ethnography of contemporary uh, sexuality among uh, impoverished uh, Mexican migrants. And of course, Larry's Translocas. That book, it, it, it's a phenomenal book. It is a wonderful uh, way in which to teach, to educate. Uh, it is, to me, I think the book is, it, it is really going to be an iconic text in the years ahead. Oh, thank you. I'm honored. Um, so that's short. <laughs> Arturo, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring to the attention two writers that most people do not know. <laughs> uh, both poets, Rosa Chavez and Manuel Soc, both Mayas, um, much younger than me both. Um, they began in introducing and mixing uh, their own concerns as Maya, as Maya subjects, as they began to write in the 1990s around the period when the alleged peace process was 
come in and sign at the end of 1996. And there was a brief period of relative ex social explosion in the country before things kind of went back to the old ways. And uh, they were major in a couple of ways, despite their youth. The fact that for all kinds of reasons um, that include, of course, everything we know emerging from the theory of coloniality of power, Mayas had to remain marginalized from many issues, um, not just in Guatemala, but I would say in Chiapas and Yucatan and in many other areas. And, and that's true of other indigenous groups, but I'm just sticking to them in this particular context. Um, but then give or take towards the end of the 1980s, indigenous literatures began to emerge and by the 1990s, they began to become visible and gain some traction. And in that context, both Rosa and Manuel, Rosa Chavez and Manuel Sok, who have and still continue to write beautiful poetry, um, not only made queerness visible in Guatemala just after the peace process was signed, but they began to work with the entire Maya community so that the entire Maya community would understand that their issues were Maya issues and that you could not separate the one from the other. And they were responsible that, you know, for, as part of the heritage of colonialism, Maya society was not only provincial, but was machocentric and in many ways, you know, backward. And they were very, very active in breaking all those issues and in making sure that the younger generations of Mayas, whether they were male, female, gay, straight, lesbian, doesn't matter, understood those processes and began to work together. And they always made a point of bringing everyone together. And that they both went international. Um, they have been main, uh, you know, featured poets at the Medellin International Festival. They did a tour of Europe. They've been all over the place, but always making sure that those things happen united into one. And I'm pretty much convinced that other than what I know of Guatemala, in many of the places where they have been, they have made sure that they bring both of those aspects together and help other indigenous communities in the globe understand the relationship. And so they are less known, a few people do know them of course, but they're less known in the US. They're not academic, they're, 100% creators, but they merit recognition along these lines, I think. Thank you, Arturo. That's a, that's a, such a rich insight because I think it, it, it kind of like puts into focus a, a kind of pattern that I think is we're seeing is the ways that um, the institutionalization of certain like ways of studying race right has always been kind of like put into crisis or, or called out for its limitations precisely through these other modes of writing right mm -hmm. that have not had the same type of institutional history or even formal protocols right and so you can right. see this in terms of this bridge you can see this in terms of la frontera right you can even make an argument i think richly mm -hmm. about the decolonial imaginary is also altering how we think about the kind of prose of historiography um, and so this is a really rich, uh, I just wanted to share my thoughts because I, I was just so over, overtaken by that. Um, no, I, to I, I totally appreciate what you just said. And I forgot to add that they also started gay pride parade in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. uh, and that because of, it was them, a lot of Mayas and a lot non-gay, lesbian, queer people who were on the left with the Mayas participate in gay pride in Guatemala, mm -hmm. which is fascinating. Wow, thank you. Uh, Tanya, Larry, do you want to, um, do you have thoughts, Tanya? Yeah, I, I, the, the one text that I would um, to circle back to is for me foundational with regards to the issues of gender and Afro-Latinidades would be the Miriam Jimenez anthology, uh, the Afro-Latino wow. reader. 
Um, and I think what's so iconic about that volume is that it um, is emblematic of the richness of Latino studies in how interdisciplinary it is um, with all sorts, you know, there's both poetry and literature and data analysis and, you know, political theory. Uh, and all of it is um, a way of providing texture uh, about the ways in which Afro-Latinidades Latina, matter. Um, but with respect to the way in which the volume does that uh, uh, on gender, uh, for me, what was sort of like mind blowing uh, was to see the collection right there all in one section um, about Afro-Latinas uh, as a subject of research um, and, you know, the um, Angela Jorge piece about being a, a black a Puerto Rican woman, um, uh, Marta Cruz Jensen's piece on uh, her I, identity as Latinegra, um, you know, the, the racial trauma uh, that it is to be uh, a derided uh, piece of, uh, or derided in femininity um, uh, because of one's Afro, uh, appearance, uh, you know, all of that uh, to have it both resonate with uh, my own on the ground experience and observations, um, but to see it theorized in that way, uh, that was really a, a masterpiece. Uh, and it's it's no wonder that it continues to be uh, so widely read and circulated. Oh, so that that is exciting. Um, I, I find it useful uh, to just uh, uh, make chronologies and, and identify moments because they, they just help me to organize uh, uh, the development of, of these thoughts. Uh, and I usually think of authors and books. So we've mentioned so much this bridge called My Back in 1981. Borderlands, La Frontera in 1987. But I think it's also uh, exciting to think about uh, moments like conferences. So, so Vicky Ruiz was pointing out 1989 uh, National Chicana Chicano Studies Conference in which people stand up and, and challenge the sexism uh, and the misogyny of, of academics and the exclusion of women. So. Uh, for me in the 1990s, getting to know Jose Esteban Munoz uh, and starting to hear those papers in 1994, 95, and then seeing the book come out of disidentifications in 1999 was truly transformational um, uh, for many reasons, in part because Jose was extraordinary, in part because I actually was at some of the performances he was writing about. Uh, so when he writes about Vaginal Davis, it's not some abstraction. I was at that concert. Uh, uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, so to see how people transform and are able to write in such a dynamic and theoretically rich way about, about things that we enjoy, but that also transform our lives is, is exciting. But the publication in 2003 of Juana Maria Rodriguez's Queer Latinidad was also a transformational moment because it's a, such a unique and strange book uh, that brings together very personal reflections about activism in San Francisco, in the Mission District, uh, about legal cases, but also about being online. Almost 20 years ago, already theorizing what it meant to be in cyberspace from a queer Latina, Cuban, American, slash honorary Puerto Rican perspective, because you all know that Juana Maria grew up in Hartford um, as a Cuban American, but in very close contact with Puerto Ricans. So those crossings, those crossings that happen are, are what excite me. And of course, because there are really exciting things coming out more recently, but to be able to, to, to make those connections, um, but also to move back. So uh, in Puerto Rico right now, Editora Educación Emergente has just released two volumes of Luisa Capetillo's writing and scholarly reflections. Um, for me in the 1990s, uh, having Julio Ramos publish an anthology of Luisa Capetillo with all of her complexities and contradictions was transformational. So it, it is really suggestive to think it's like, we don't have to start in 1969 with Stonewall or, or with the Chicana Movimiento. 
we can claim we, we can claim a much longer historical period for these intersections of Latina, Latino, gender and sexuality, radical thinking uh, that sometimes we're clearly not recognized in academia. Uh, so that's what we get to do. We get to explain how this anarchist thought, for example, circulating in anarchist newspapers or being presented as speeches. Um, Silvia Rivera ran away from home at the age of 10. Um, she did not have an education. But Silvia Rivera is a, a, a theorist. She is a theorist of what it means to be homeless, incarcerated, a sex worker, um, and transgender. Uh, and she conveyed this thought through her speeches. She conveyed this knowledge through her interviews. Uh, and she conveyed this thought through the very limited number of articles that she wrote in life. Thank you, Larry. That's that's so illuminating. I mean, I think. I really appreciate how you point not only to, I mean, it makes me think not only of scholarly proceedings and the, the institutional history of ethnic studies in that way, but also the kind of community presses, the kind of, for me, El Grito del Norte, uh, Northern New Mexico Española is key transformational text and and kind of thinking about how to, how to um, situate the, the localized struggles in a kind of broader internationalist frame. Um, and so I think that, also, your, the, the example of Sylvia Rivera also points us to that this, this realization that the, the analysis is, is also happening in these quotidian moments, right? In these moments that seem so unmonumental or, or so kind of beneath the radar, or so that have been so invisibilized by, by the discourse that we use to, to prove things, right? And so um, I think I, I want to kind of shift this to the to our next question because I think there's there's a lot of what we're already discussing that's implicated in and what I want to kind of explore in this next question, and which is trying to think about how Latinx studies has been you know traditionally framed through a nationalist lens. But Arturo, Tanya, you know your work um, and Larry as well, and Vicky also calls for a, a more global perspective to 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 the national lens, how we think about the the emergence of Latinx studies in a national frame. And so just as we've been discussing how gender and sexuality disrupted nationalist narratives, how does thinking comparatively about racialization within the Latinx community or mul multiple communities help us to kind of move beyond this nationalist frame or to situate it in a certain way, right? So for example, you know, uh, indigenous and African heritage heritages among Latinx peoples and communities is abundant, but at the same time, it's invisibilized, right? And so, I think meanwhile, we see uh, a rise in Central American genocide implied in the current migration patterns that we're seeing in this moment. And so this requires the field's attention to kind of grapple with the kind of much different and variegated uh, global terrain. And so just, I guess this is a question, I guess, also about a global Latinidad, right? Um, and what that kind of, and what kind of that framework can you, uh, can allow us to think uh, in relationship to ongoing contexts and peoples throughout the world. Um, and how might perhaps even a feminist or queer perspective also be central to this kind of reshaping? So um, perhaps we can, if we want to stay in the order that we've already established, that's fine. If we want to shake it up, um, I suppose that's also very much welcome. Well, I can start. I mean, uh, for, for me, uh, the first thing I think about is language. And, and, and provincialism and the insularity of people in the US who think that, well, uh, the assumption that you only need to read English uh, or, or to wait for those translations, which sometimes take 20 and 30 years to come because there is so little interest in the, the, the thought that is being generated elsewhere. So I, I really see myself um, trying to bring together uh, or to read, to read in Spanish and to read in Portuguese and to read in English and to think critically what it means and to facilitate translation, to facilitate translation from English to Spanish, but also from Spanish and Portuguese um, to English, which you could say, I mean, we don't even have to step outside of the United States um, for that because, well, which is one of the challenges of reading and teaching and Saldua in a classroom where not everybody has the linguistic competencies uh, to, to follow in English and Spanish. And, and of course, um, but also just to understand, well, I mean, that is a wonderful moment of crisis when you don't understand everything. 
Mm -hmm. um, I would go there also a little bit, you know, as a historical process. Um, I came to the U.S. in 88 and stay, have stayed since until now. And then I started working in academia a year after that. And of course, being at San Francisco State, where there was the history of the riots of the early 1970s, which had led to the creation of the Department of La Raza Studies, it was a big thing and a big presence at that time. And yet, though I knew many Central Americans in general who lived in the Bay Area and elsewhere, and who had fled from the various Central American wars into the US, they remained basically invisibilized within what was then the Latino community, which was exclusively uh, Puerto Rican, Cuban, and Mexican. And so we began talking about those things and what the implications were and what the limitations were, and um, began trying to move into that direction and knock at different doors, participate in academic events, addressing that issue. And finally, you know, I wrote that article about Central American Americans, which by sheer luck appeared in the very first issue of Latino Studies. And so that shook a little bit the interest of other people to move along those lines. And I remember that, that same year, I think it was at the MLA, I met Claudia Millian, who was still a graduate student at the time, and who also felt that you know, she wanted to bring in the Central American with the Latino, but she also had African descent, and so she wanted that to be part of the whole thing too. And we began brainstorming about all kinds of issues along those ways. And then there was a whole series of young writers um, Central American American writers, if you will, uh, who began to publish in roughly in that first decade of the 21st century, young, all of them, many of them in California, many of them uh, doing really fascinating bilingual work. Um, and um, they immediately began to kind of build their own case around what we were doing, I think fast went well beyond what we were doing, which is great because it's always wonderful to see young people learn from you and then move on and do it much better than you. Um, and so that began to, I think, not just that on my part, because on the other hand, there were other people doing other kind of work, Colombians in the East Coast, et cetera, et cetera. Um, began to you know, tackle that issue so that Latinity came to be understood in a much, much broader sense. And then when I got to UT Austin, we began working along those lines with Charlie Hale, and we had a yearly conference, very big conference called the Lozano Long uh, Conference, uh, which uh, we began focusing on many of these issues and bringing people to challenge the theoretical constructs of what, if you will, be, could be called mainstream Latino studies in the earlier period. And then all that began to explode. And at the same time, of course, my wife, Chell Robbins, worked on Spanish issues. So we would spend every summer in Madrid. We had tons of friends there. It was almost our second home. And we began to notice the impact of Latinos in Spain not just the earlier political exiles like Chileans and Argentinians, but all the Ecuadorians who were now living in Spain, all the Dominicans that were now living in Spain, and then seeing the transformation of artistic production in Spain itself becoming part of what now would be global Latinidades. Um, you know, like right now, perhaps the best example at this time, but this did not happen just by accident, is the singer Rosalia, who totally blends all kinds of issues within her music that is absolutely fantastic and has the Spaniards totally blown away. But she's kind of like emerging as the peak result of what was in Spain itself, a movement in that direction, that kind of, on the one hand, 
remaining somewhat insular until the 1980s. And on the other one, the explosion of Latino migration into Spain of all kinds uh, that began totally transforming you know, Spanish cinema, Spanish music, Spanish everything. And then when I met other people who lived uh, in Germany and other parts of Europe, it became obvious that some of the same things were happening there. We began comparing notes. And I think that many of us, because we were not a movement, we were friends, but many of us began thinking, oh, you know, this is like a global phenomenon. This is not like um, just an accident that it's happening in various European countries that is happening in some African countries that is happening in crazy places like Japan. Uh, so that we began to see then what now would be global Latinidades um, and other people plunge into it. Here in California, we have now that project which was actually led by Ben Olguin at UC Santa Barbara. And then Claudia Milian has of course been published on Latinx from a global perspective, uh, at least the last 10 years or so. Um, and so I think that it's inevitable given the movement of the planet as a whole into global issues that impact everybody and in which unless you happen to be a weird hermit, you cannot stay away from what's happening elsewhere in the world. Because even if you don't want to, you the first thing you do if you grab your phone and want to call somebody is read what happened today in Ukraine or somewhere else. And so that you are connected in that sense and everybody's impacting everybody else's culture. And so in that sense, it is only logical that it would happen. I think that may, there are many other kind of global movements also that do not include Latinidades, but certainly there is one in which Latinidades play a very central role, and oftentimes in which the performers or the people who run away with it are not Latinos, but they might come from somewhere else. Rosa Chavez told me, going back to my friend Rosa, that she got invited to Norway to go uh, visit the Sami, the Sami communities in Northern Norway, and she was surprised to discover that they were playing Latin music, and that was their favorite music because it, it gave them all the rhythm that somehow they identify with. So, you know, there are issues like that happen, I think, that push us in that direction or make us have to acknowledge that it's happening, whether we want to be a part or not. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, Tanya, Vicky? I, yes, I'd like to jump on in. Um, I'll just sort of put a pin in reacting to the Rosalia mention, um, just simply remarking that, um, Part of what makes her controversial and problematic from an Afro-Latina perspective uh, is her essentially doing kind of a blackface, right? Um, but that is a nice jump off for me uh, with respect to why for me it is so fundamental as an Afro-Latina scholar to do the comparative work and to think globally. Um, I cannot adequately critique issues of discrimination, colorism, et cetera, uh, within, Afro, uh, within Latinidades without being able to deconstruct the mythologies that could um, remain uh, extant <laughs> uh, without the comparison. So from the theoretical to the concrete, what I mean by that is this. If all I ever did was try to look at how do we understand colorism in Latino communities in the United States, et cetera, there's a way in which the, uh, the discourse can uh, be so insular that it will, re it will refer to um, the, uh, the uh, re US racialization experience as uh, the sole explanatory force for what we do to one another and how we react to blank blackness and, and the existence of anti-blackness within Afro-Latino, within Latinidades. Uh, so by doing the comparative work, what I try and many others as well uh, seek to illuminate is that when you see the very same strands of anti-Blackness that exists within Latin America and have long existed within Latin America, you cannot explain the anti-Blackness of Latinos in the United States as being somehow a U.S. construct. Right? Like it wasn't made, it wasn't born in the U.S. We brought it with us. Right? Um, and 
it's got its own kind of dynamic and energy within Latin America and the Caribbean as well. The globalizing uh, aspects are, are the ways in which these things mutually <laughs> feed on one another, um, but also the way in which, um, dare I say it, you know, the answer, the hope is also global as well. And so that the Afro-Latino uh, uh, civil rights movements, right, they're, they're plural, uh, because it's across uh, these Las Americas uh, that uh, Afro Latinos are being able to be able to check the nonsense of their respective locations. Right? So that, you know, uh, when, uh, well, I'll circle back to the beginning, when a Rosalia sort of pops out with a gold tooth in her mouth, a Durina to sort of uh, imitate Black swagger and what have you uh, from her a European positionality uh, and be able to ascend. Uh, in ways that someone who is darker skin uh, and is not from Europe would, would never be able to do in quite the same way. Uh, we can speak to one another in order to be able to see the ways in which, am I crazy? Is this really happening? Right. Uh, the, the way in which we have that mutual recognition as Latinos and Latinas within all our faculty meetings, right? The, did that just happen? Did I hear that? Is that really? Right. Uh, this on a global level that is fundamental. Uh, from being able to counteract all forms of anti-Blackness, even those that are masked as being um, complementary in love with Blackness at the same time that it makes a mockery of it. Um, as you can tell, I get very heated about this stuff. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, long story short, th this work it can't be, for me at least, cannot be, you cannot uh, try to pierce the veil of the, uh, the pathologies of Latino and Latin American anti-Blackness without doing anything about the comparative and global uh, in a manner. Thank you. <laughs> Vicki, do you wanna add something? Or your mic's muted. Uh, what I would add, I mean, I'm just blown away by, by Tanya's remarks uh, is that I think, <laughs> Part of it is that we get very boxed in, not in culturally, but also in terms of the ways in which we are trained. Uh, in my own work on uh, labor and civil rights activist Luisa Moreno, uh, it's been evolved into a much more transnational study. I mean, she was a teenage feminist Guatemalan poet who became a published poet in Mexico by the mid 1920s. She's consorting with the likes of Naui Olin. Um, and I'm reminded of that in that I was writing uh, an article on Luisa, comparing Luisa Capetillo and Luisa Moreno. And I was reminded of my nationalist bias because I sent it to uh, uh, Asuncion Lavin, who was really one of the founders of gender. In, in Latin American history. And I said it to Asuncion, I said, I'd really love your feedback. And she gave it back. She goes, well, nice article written by a US historian. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yes, guilty. So she gave me, you know, I, I gave me a, a wonderful reading list that I consumed, that I incorporated. And it took about two more drafts before she finally said, okay, this." You've got the transnational perspective. And I think I would love to see more people sort of celebrate Asuncion. She was one of the first, uh, first of the first 11 women. She was the she was the first, one of the first 11 women to get a PhD from Harvard, not Radcliffe, but from Harvard in 1963. I mean, and she wrote a dissertation uh, on nuns in colonial Mexico from a gendered perspective. Uh, and I would love for, you know, to, to, she's very guarded, but I would just, I, I keep pushing her that she needs to, to write about, to write about her journey. Because for a long time, she did not get an academic position. And, when, and she taught for many years uh, at Howard, uh, did not have access to graduate students. And then after she retired from Howard, uh, went to Arizona State. And, and really built an incredible uh, Latin American graduate program. 
Thank what you, a, Vicky. That's what segues. a great what a great story. Well, I, yeah, I thank you. I, I, that segues really beautifully into our next question, which was proposed by you. But before that, I I really want to. I'm so appreciative of the fact that already we've acknowledged so many people. I mean, it is when you celebrate Latin American Latinx studies at 50, you expect some people with the past, but many people were taken from us very early, right? Jose Munoz, Juan Flores, Miriam Jimenez, Arturo Islas, right? And mm -hmm. so I just really want to start off by thanking, you know, all of them who were, uh, who were part of the community that sustained me. And, and so in that context, I ask, um, you know, uh, Vicky reminds us that uh, first generation or second generation feminist scholars in Latinx fields had to turn to communities of support that sustained us through graduate school and as assistant professors. And so Simone and I would love to hear more about this and also what your takes might be on and 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 uh, the story of as you really do have to get on Susan Sion to write her story because I think it would be really not just inspirational but so yeah. sustaining for the graduate students on the market today right because we have this professionalization of Latinx study mm -hmm. that has changed the communities of support as well as the relationships that we have to movements or community mentors so um, you know we're thinking obviously of what the bedrock of heteronormative family unit that was taken down by by gender and sexuality studies right and has been was such a fundamental part of the anti-colonial nationalisms that we also are birthed from but um latinx and gender and sexuality studies has showed us how patriarchal and colonial violence was produced by these familial norms but so what steps into the breach right who are our mentors now you know and what happens with professionalization and what steps into the breach when the family unit the heteronormative family unit is disrupted as the site of uh kinship and home and also as the site of social movements and I don't know who wants to start. Oh, I also want to remind, Larry put this in the chat, very important in terms of global Blackness, Lorgias Garcia Pena's forthcoming book, Translating Blackness, Latinx Colonialities in Global Perspective. It's, um, it's, it's and Larry put the link to that in the chat. Who wants to start us off? Well, and, Ta and Tanya just put the link to her forthcoming book, which is also uh, an important contribution. I guess that you mentioned me, I would just sort of point out, I, I just sort of want to start out with like in a letter uh, for my file, for my career file, a Stanford professor in 1980 warned potential job interviewers that I came across in a breathless sort of way. And that the quality of my mind was in his view, not even truly first rate. You know, thank you. Uh, and then also said that he wasn't the only Stanford professor who felt that way. Uh, thank heavens, I mean, Al Camarillo, Estelle Friedman, I mean, Estelle modeled feminist mentorship. She was, you could be accessible, you could be humane, you could be strong. And also, I would not have finished, I don't think, without uh, the degree if it had not been, if I had not met Patricia Sevea, uh, Denise Segura, Beatriz Pesquera. Adela de la Torre, because they were really, really important for, for me in terms of, of talking about, you know, sort of what is Chicana feminism was a consciousness. Uh, we all had sort of, uh, I really felt I bonded with them when there was all the critiques about family, because that point was sort of the apex of uh, familialism, the idea of political familialism, that there's something extra special about the, the, the Chicano family that you know, surmounts obstacles, a very ro romantic portrait. And already even at this early stage, it's like, well, not my family. Uh, <laughs> then we began to sort of, uh, the, the, to begin to sort of shatter uh, that notion of, uh, of, of these, um, of that all Latino families are loving and supportive. Uh, and begin to sort of really begin to challenge the, the patriarchal uh, underlays uh, of familialism. And it was interesting is that, you know, I wrote about county workers in Southern California, Pat wrote about county workers in Northern California, and that having someone to be able to, to, to talk with 
uh, without having to sort of explain what you do and why you think it's important. And then when our, as our, our books came out, people were like trying to pit us up, well, you know, so-and-so. And it's like, yeah, she's my friend. You know, what's going on here? Because there became this, and, and to me, it was like that, that level of support and that has sustained me because of Davis, you know, Angie Chabran, Beatriz Pesquera and I were Las Brujas del Norte. Because, because we, you know, we, you know, we were, we were, we were assistant professor troublemakers. Um, and I think that that, and, and, and Pat Mora, when I was at UTEP, I'd never lived on the border. She was like my border in the Patna. I mean, she was my guide, not only of how an institution works and doesn't work, but also about El Paso in the border because I'd never lived there. So she and her, and, and my students really educated me. Thank you, Vicki. Um, a lot of those women mentored me too, so. <laughs> uh, Larry, Arturo, Tanya. Larry, you wanna go next? Um, I, I can certainly go next. So, wow. Um, so I was thinking a couple of things. So number one, um, Josie, you were just mentioning grad students and I was thinking the, the value of mentorship. When Jean Franco introduced me to Arnaldo Cruz Malave, I thought she was just being nice and presenting one of her former students. I, I didn't realize she was setting up a lifelong mentorship relationship, uh, which is uh, would be a, a scholarly dialogue, but also a friendship. So I, I was a naive graduate student, or maybe I just didn't understand the, the importance of those connections and those friendships. But, but I can tell you that more recently, I, I've been very involved in, in a couple of projects, and I think that the reason I'm involved in them is because they, they really sustain me and, and they, they give my life and my work meaning in different ways. So one of them is very recently co-organizing the Colloquio del Otro Lao in Puerto Rico at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayagüez. Um, because it's like, what does it mean to do queer studies from Puerto Rico and not from Rio Piedras or San Juan, but from the periphery? From, from Mayagüez, of course, from a very prestigious uh, uh, campus of the UPR, but still one that is, that is not usually considered or thought of. What, what does it mean to do, to do uh, queer studies uh, outside, um, outside of the central spaces? Then the other thing is that um, the Queer Americas Research Group, which really has brought together people like uh, Maria Amelia Viteri and Salvador Vidal Ortiz, and Marcia Ochoa and, and so many others um, to, to really think transnationally, to, to really think multilingually, to really think of the intersections of Latinidad and Latinidades as a US-based project, but also as a global project, whether it is hemispherically uh, or whether it is in Spain or in Canada or elsewhere. So those are things that I find uh, sustain me and that I really appreciate. I would like to, sorry. Go uh, right ahead. No, just also from my angle, celebrate Jim Franco, uh, because she was also decisive in a different way. When I first came to the US, Jean had lived in Guatemala as probably most of you know. Um, Juan Antonio Franco, her first husband, and the last time that she never took off was a Guatemalan painter whom she met in Europe who had been given a scholarship by the presidency of Jacobo Arbenz. And so she sailed from Italy with him back to Guatemala, got to know Guatemala, and lived the, the U.S. invasion in 54 in Guatemala. And so one of the things I was always grateful to Jean was that even when she knew very little of me. I had just arrived. I was young, I was green. Um, she was in solidarity because of the Guatemalan background. And um, we would, whenever I saw her from then to more recently, we would always talk about what was happening in Guatemala. Have you been in touch? Have you not been in touch? Who do you see? Who don't you see? Um, that created a complicity and I know for a fact I wasn't the only one because there was, I never studied with her. There was no objective reason why she should write a lot of recommendation for me simply because I was Guatemalan in like 1988. But 
she always had that gesture of solidarity that is in, for me an ethical position, which I do try to learn from in supporting everybody who needs support to move along those lines and in making connections between people so that you know that can lead to perhaps something new. Occasionally it doesn't work, well big deal, but keep bringing people together, keep pushing if you can. Um, there are very few people I've met like that. Charlie Hell would be another one, but um, for me, they're exemplary scholars in that sense, no? In that while being first-class scholars, they're also first-class in political solidarity and never go outside of their ethics in trying to be supportive of issues like this, regardless occasionally of whom they're helping. And I think that's a wonderful lesson. I've seen the opposite sometimes in other scholars who I will not name, <laughs> who basically fall in love with themselves and with their name and with their alleged fame and live in a little isolation, looking askance at people who might cast a shadow on them and not at all you know, trying to connect with others and especially with ordinary people. And, and so I think that Jean deserves that. She does. She's been supportive mm -hmm. of so many people and advanced so many of us in our career. Mm -hmm. um, I will I will call her for her birthday and I will say her mouth was in the, her word, name word was in, her name was among us. <laughs> uh, Tanya, do you want to take us out? I do. I mean, I know we're sort of going co co close to the end, but I, I was just so inspired by everybody's um, shares. And so but there's three ways in, in which um, this sort of speaks to me. Uh, one, a very personal one, but all tied together with regards to the way in which Latino studies is for me very much about the production of knowledge. Right? Um, and so the, and, and, and our support of one another is to that end. Uh, um, so when I was you know, young in academia, uh, actually my very first year of teaching, there was a New York Times uh, article that got me all fired up. I was very mad. Um, and it was sort of this exotification of multiracial identity as something that was going to like solve racism. And we didn't need the Civil Rights Act anymore because, you know, all we had to do was just mix it up together. And, you know, boom, boom, with our mixy babies, we were going to solve racism. Um, and so I wrote this response, a letter to the editor, not an op-ed, right? but they gave me a lot of real estate uh, uh, on the editorial page. Uh, and in the letter, I essentially said, you know, this ain't no, this is Misty Sahe. Come to Latin America, come to the Caribbean, learn something and stop talking such nonsense, right? I mean, take a comparative perspective. I said to my first year of teaching, Miriam Jimenez Roman saw that letter to the editor, found me uh, at my university at the time and said, come to Brooklyn, <laughs> her headquarters at the time. <laughs> um, we should meet. You didn't know me from a hole in the wall. Uh, she's a, she was a senior person at the Schomburg Center. Uh, and she just, you know, reached out to plug because she thought she saw some sort of germ of like, th maybe this girl's got something more to say <laughs> and let me help her along. Lifelong mentor, crushing to me when she passed. Um, so there's that, right? The reaching out to see sort of like, how can we nurture this growth? Um, the other is with respect to how we do that in our institutional involvement. So uh, years later, I become involved with Suzanne Obler uh, and the reboot of the Latino Studies Journal. And I was very honored when she pulled me in to do that. Um, but what was really even more exciting was to see her approach and you know, that's carried through um, with Lourdes' um, uh, man taking over the mantle uh, of the Latino Studies Journal. And the, the, what I'm referring to here is the way in which as an editorial policy, it wasn't about, oh, let's sift through here and reject stuff and then only take the best. It was also about reaching back and actually nurturing the authors who needed some extra help before we even sent it for a referral, you know, for the referee review. Meaning like that the production of knowledge is not just about taking those people who look like superstars and then letting them ascend, right? Um, and, you know, helping them along, but also taking those people a little rough around the edges right? um, and need a little extra help. Uh, that was inspiring to me to, to have that 
because I come from the law. Okay. That ain't the way we do it in law school. Let's just put it that way. Um, so it was a whole new way of thinking about how we do production of knowledge in nurturing our young people, uh, even before, you know, they get to the um, blind review process. Uh, and then finally, trying to learn a little something from the young people uh, in my life, what I have found sort of carries this uh, thread through within Latino studies is social media, the social media communities, I should say, not just like, you know, all the cray cray that happens out on Twitter, um, but the Twitter communities. For me, it has been sustaining to have these beautiful conversations with other Afro-Latino scholars and Afro-Latino thinkers, you know, whether they be singers, artists, et cetera, but all really concerned about elevating uh, and giving tribute and respect and visibility uh, to the Afro-Latino subject. Uh, and I see that do happening a lot in just a couple of, you know, characters on Twitter, but with the links to literature. Right? So people who are not in academia at all, but are reaching into academia to give uh, light to what they're experiencing right on the ground. I think that it's like a beautiful way in which like the new technology can be put to good, not just to evil. Uh, but thank you for letting me get, out, get that all out. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was a wonderful way. I'm so sorry we have to close this panel. That was a wonderful way to end it. Um, it's exactly what we hoped for. It was just so wonderful to hear from all of you. Our sincere thanks from the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and from the Latinx Project, from Robert, Simon, myself, and Arlene. Um, and we look forward to bringing you, some of you back for your new books uh, in the fall and the spring. Uh, we host some conversations there and continue, hopefully now in person. And of course, we're always gonna be hybrid. Thank you so, so much to, your, to the audience as well. I'm terribly sorry we did not get to your question. Uh, but um, if, if some of the panelists want to take a quick look, maybe you can dash out a quick answer. Um, anyway, uh, we are two minutes early, actually. So any last, <laughs> any last, I was so anxious to stop on time, but any last thoughts? I'll just say quickly, thank you to everyone. I really appreciate um, all the, the, the really robust and luminous dialogue. It was such an honor to learn from you in person after having learned from you uh from your texts and uh prior prior publications and uh i, I see that this is a you know a really um a moment that's really uh it, it makes me optimistic about about uh like what what's possible right so i just want to just say thank you for for this event and let's make sure we give our flowers to arlene davila i, yeah. I wrote in the chat she's yeah. a blessing <laughs> <Latinx> <laughs> studies. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Arlene, for, for getting the ball rolling for this uh, third, but not necessarily last, uh, Latinx, uh, Latinx Studies at 50 panel. Bueno, muchísimas gracias a todos. Un fuerte abrazo. Um, and I guess we are, we're, we're done here. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care.